If you're like me and you grew up using a traditional steel body western style hand plane like this one with its fancy depth adjuster and lateral adjustment and solid steel body, you may wonder why in the world would anybody consider using a Japanese style hand plane and all of its simplicity. Well, I want to go through the process of showing you how to set up a Japanese style hand plane and using it to get wispy thin shavings and perhaps you might consider using one in your shop. One of the great things about a Japanese style hand plane is its simplicity. There are really only three parts that we need to be concerned with. The first is the wood body called a die, spelled D-A-I. It's typically made from beech or oak and if you look at the end grain a lot of times they're made from a quarter sawn blank for that extra stability. Now, being made of wood, sometimes they do need straightened and flattened, but that's an easy process that I'll show you how to do later. The next major component and, and the workhorse of the plane, of course, is the blade. These are usually made by a master blacksmith. They're very thick, they're very heavy, they provide a lot of mass for the cutting action, and they're made of laminated steel to provide an ultimate sharp edge. The last piece is the chip breaker, and it's a relatively modern invention. I mean, Japanese hand planes originated from the Chinese, and originally they only consisted of the body and the blade. It was a relatively recent development that they've added a chip breaker. So I'm going to break all these components down and show you how to tune up each part so that when it's all assembled, you'll get great performance. Like Western style hand planes, Japanese hand planes come in a variety of sizes. Unlike a Western style hand plane, the smaller planes are called block planes. The larger ones are reserved for smoothing wider panels. Another important difference from a Western style hand plane is that this is considered the front of the plane and this is considered the back. The reason is the Japanese hand planes are designed to be used on the pull stroke. So just keep that in mind as you go about tuning up your hand plane, or if you see references to the front and back, you'll know that it's backwards from a Western style hand plane. When you buy a brand new Japanese plane, you're basically getting a kit of parts. You get the die, you get the blade, and you get the chip breaker. But the chip breaker and the blade aren't fit to the die, and that's a process you have to go through with every Japanese plane that you purchase, you want to make sure that that blade is properly seated. Now the die maker, when they make these planes, he kind of leaves the, the opening kind of rough and purposely tight so that you can fine tune the fit of that blade into the body or the die. Since a Japanese plane only has three components, the question always comes up, especially from Western hand plane users, how do you go about adjusting the blade for its lateral position, to keep that cutting edge parallel with the bottom of the sole, and how do you adjust the depth of the blade to determine the thickness of the shaving? And then the other question is, how do you go about removing the blade in the first place? Well, let's talk about that first. If you look on every Japanese plane, behind the blade at the end of the die is a chamfered edge. This chamfered edge is what we use to strike the die and the action of hitting that die forces it forward, which essentially pops the blade backwards. Now, something I want to point out is when you do that, you want to tap each side evenly and not tap the center. If you tap the center really hard, there is the potential that you could split the die, and we certainly don't want to do that. So I'm just going to tap this until the blade pops loose. Now you can see I have the die, the chip breaker, and the blade. Now like all Japanese chisels and uh, plain irons that are hand forged, there's a hollow formed in the back. And that's intentional. The reason is that when we flatten the back, we really only need to be concerned with these edges, these side edges and up along the cutting edge. So as we flatten the back, we just need to make sure that those three surfaces end up coplanar and flat. 
If we look up here, we can see a stamped mark, and that's made by the blacksmith or the, the person that made the blade. If we look at the bevel side of this blade, you can see that it's laminated. There are two distinct layers. The cutting edge is made from a very hard steel that can be honed to an ultra sharp edge. And then the blacksmith uses a softer steel on top of that. It adds mass and it also helps protect the brittle steel of the cutting edge. The first thing I like to do when I get a new plane is to sharpen the iron. That way I know that it's ready to go and can be fit into the die when that time comes. As with any sharpening of any tool, a chisel or a plane iron, you want to make sure that the back is flat first. I'm using a series of water stones and I'm going all the way up through 12,000 grit. Now I've already done some work on this iron starting at around 1,000 grit just to make sure that the back was flat and I worked my way through all the grits and I'm going to finish up with 12,000. I really like that polished edge because I believe that the more polished the edge and the more polished the back, the sharper that edge is going to be. So I want to do that, but the first thing to remember is, especially if you're using water stones, is that they must be flat. So I want to go through the process of flattening these stones, and to do that, I use a flattening stone. And I make sure my stones are wet, my water stones are wet. Then I use my flattening stone, and I just rub it across the top of the water stone. And I keep doing that and checking it to make sure that I'm removing material and I don't stop until I get an even color all the way across that stone. And I'm going to go ahead and make sure that these other two stones are flat and then we can go about sharpening our blade. When I sharpen any plain iron or chisel, I like to turn my stone so that it's parallel with the front edge of my bench. That way I can come across here and use that long edge to put a polish on that back. So I'm just going to, I'm holding down on top of that bevel to make sure that that iron is absolutely flat on the stone. You want to make sure that you never lift up on that back edge, otherwise you risk rounding over the edge of the bevel. So I'm just going to go back and forth on this, and then you move on to the next stone and work your way all the way up through. So I'm going to go ahead and do that, and then we'll turn the iron over and work on the bevel. So what I'm looking for is a nice polish all along these sides, the cutting edge and up the other side. And we only need to be concerned with the last half or three quarters of an inch or so, just to make sure that that's coplanar all the way across. When I hone the bevel, I sharpen by hand. And the reason is a blade like this that's tapered from the top all the way down to the bottom it's going to be kind of hard to fit into a honing guide. And I've got this nice wide bevel here because the blade is so thick. That makes it easy to register that right on the stone. And I don't have to be too concerned about rocking it as I would with a thinner blade. So what I'm doing again is I'm just holding pressure down on that edge of the blade right on top of the bevel. And I'm just going to go back and forth. and check my progress. Once I'm happy with that, I move on to the next stone. Again, making sure that it stays wet. Just like we do on a Western style smoothing plane, we're going to form just the slightest little camber on this cutting edge. And that just simply means we're removing the slightest material at these far outside edges. And that's so that our shaving tapers edge to edge and leaves a nice smooth surface. Now I'm talking microscopic camber here, so it doesn't take much. The way I do it is I put my blade down and I just put my pressure all on one corner and make maybe eight or 10 strokes across the stone. And then I come back to the opposite edge, the opposite corner, put my pressure down on that side and do the same thing. And that should be about it. I'm going to finish up on my polishing stone here. This one is 12,000 grit. And we should be good to go. Now, if you've got a brand new blade and that hasn't been honed before, you may want to start somewhere around 1,000, 3,000 grit and work your way up. 
This blade has already been honed, so I'm just putting a final edge on it. Now, as you sharpen, you might start to feel a little bit of a burr or a wire edge on the back side of that bevel. And that's because the steel is getting forced back as you're sharpening that edge. And you really want to have a burr because that means your edge is ultra sharp. To get rid of the burr, I just take my finest sharpening stone, put the blade flat on its back, one stroke back. That's all I do. And I think this blade is ready to go. So I'm gonna go about fitting it into the die and show you how to go through that process. Remember I said that when you purchase a new Japanese hand plane, the blade and the chip breaker don't fit and seat all the way into the die. So I went ahead and sharpened my blade, got it nice and sharp. Our next task then is to fit the blade into the opening of the die. Now to do that, you're gonna need a variety of tools. First one is a mallet. We use it to set and adjust the blade and also to remove it. A soft pencil, we're gonna use it to mark the back of the blade so that we can tell where the high spots are in our die. I have here a set of Japanese rasps and plane floats. They're kind of unique. If you take a look at them, this particular float has teeth just on the edge and the remaining faces are smooth. On this one, I just have teeth on the face and the, the sides and the back are smooth. And then this Japanese rasp has teeth on both sides, but the edges are still smooth. The reason they do that is so that you can remove material from one surface without damaging the adjacent surface. You're going to want to have some sharp chisels on hand. And we're gonna use a card scraper later to form hollows in the bottom of the die. Unlike a Western style plane where we sometimes obsess over the flatness of the sole, a Japanese hand plane is purposely hollowed out so that it only has two contact points, one at the back and one right ahead of the blade. Sometimes they'll add an additional contact point for extra stability if you're planing narrow work pieces, for example. Between those three contact points or two contact points, if that's all you have, we're going to form a very, very slight hollow just by removing a little bit of wood. And that's where the card scraper comes in. The first thing I'm going to do is take a soft pencil and we're going to go to the bevel side of the blade and mark it. Just put a nice coat of lead on there. And then you bring the die up on a Japanese plane. The bevel is down. You're going to tap that in place. And you'll see that the graphite from the pencil marks the high spots that we need to remove from the mouth of the die. To do that, I like to use a rasp. If you're handy with a chisel, you can do that as well. Just you want to go really slow and take it really easy to make sure to not to remove too much material all at once. This is a fine tuning process. You just take it slow and you keep testing the fit of the iron until it's seated properly. So I'm going to take my rasp. I'm going to file away some of those high spots and you could actually use the end of your rasp as a scraper to scrape just the areas that are high. That looks pretty good. You want to stay away from the side grooves for now. We'll, we'll address those later. Go ahead and insert your blade. Remember, bevel down. Tap it in place. And you keep checking it until you get an even marking all the way across. And actually, this isn't bad. I've got one little high spot here I'm going to take care of. Now, you want to keep testing the fit of the blade until it's about a sixteenth of an inch inside the mouth opening. When you get to that point, you can work on the side grooves. 
when you first purchase your plane, remember I said that blade is gonna fit tight and there's not gonna be much wiggle room side to side. So what we need to do is remove some material at the top of those side grooves so that we can move the blade laterally to adjust it, make it parallel to the bottom of the plane. To do that, you can use a very narrow chisel and work on removing some material up at the top of that side groove. I like to use a plane float because it fits in there nice and does a great job. You want to make sure that you concentrate only on the top edge of the side groove. You don't want to remove material close to the mouth. We just want to be able to move the top of the blade left and right just a little bit. Our goal is to leave about a sixteenth of an inch or less on either side of the blade, just enough to allow that blade to move a little bit. So when you put your blade in there, you can see I've got just a little bit of wiggle room there at the sides. And that's perfect. So once you get that done and the blade is sitting within a millimeter or two or a sixteenth inch or so from the mouth opening, the next thing to do is take a look at the chip breaker. The chip breaker is also often made by the same blacksmith that made the blade. The wide bevel comes to a sharp edge and you want to try to polish up that bevel a little bit, maybe on a sharpening stone or with some fine sandpaper so that the shavings can kind of roll up off of that bevel. If I turn this over, you can see we've got the leading edge here. The blacksmith also formed what I call ears on the back side where he actually bent over the corners. So those two corners and the entire front edge are what needs to contact the back of the blade. So if I take my chip breaker and set it about a 30 second away from the cutting edge, I'm going to take this and look through there and make sure I don't see any light between the chip breaker and the blade right at that edge. If I see any light, I know I've got some work to do to flatten this chip breaker so that that is nice and tight all the way across. Also, you want to take your fingers and put pressure on opposite corners to see if it rocks at all. If it's not flat, you'll hear some clicking and I've, you can hear that on mine. I've got just a little bit of material to, to address there. And I do that simply by taking a file and removing just a little bit from the ear that's contacting the blade. So once we've got our chip breaker fitting nice and tight and it doesn't rock at all, we can go ahead and get this ready to fit into the die. Now there's one thing I want to point out. When you stick your blade in, you can maybe you can see that the mouth opening is actually from here to here. If your blade is wider than the opening, use a coarse water stone or a diamond stone to just nick off the corners of your iron until it fits inside the width of that opening. One last thing to point out is that there's a piece of material here on the die on either side of the opening where the blade projects. I go ahead and remove a little bit of that material Sometimes it can interfere with the flatness of the sole. So I just take a chisel and just kind of chip out a little relief there before I go and fit the blade in. So now you can assemble the chip breaker and the blade. Put them in the die. Remember you're keeping that chip breaker about 30 seconds away from the cutting edge of the iron. And you're just going to secure everything in place. Now my blade is not projecting from the mouth opening, which is perfect because I, all I want to do at this point is put proper tension on the die so that we can go about the task of flattening it and forming the hollows. To form the hollows, I like to use a square and mark a line all oh, about three eighths of an inch, quarter of an inch away from the mouth at the back of the plane, I'm going to do the same. Check the sole with 
a straight edge and make sure that it's flat. If the sole isn't flat, you can lay a piece of sandpaper down on a piece of MDF or glass or something nice and flat and level and work the plane back and forth with the blade in place until the bottom is nice and smooth. Again, you can mark the bottom and when all the pencil marks are gone, you know that the bottom is flat. Once you're sure the bottom is nice and flat, you can go about the task of hollowing out between these two points so that all you have contacting the workpiece is this strip right here and this strip right at the cutting edge. To do that, I like to use a card scraper. And for this, you can take the, take the blade out for now. So you can clamp the die to your workbench or put it in a face vise. And I'm going to use a card scraper to kind of form a hollow between these two contact points. And we're not talking much. All I'm doing is just removing a few thin shavings until I can see some light under the straight edge. You can also use a wide chisel that's sharp and use it as a scraper, like so does a really good job of removing material. And believe it or not, that's about all I need to do to form enough of a hollow so that the only parts contacting the workpiece are at the end and right next to the mouth. You will also want to do the same thing on the back side if you're going to be planing a lot of narrow work pieces, you may want a third contact point back here. But for this one, this is going to be a smoothing plane. I want to just go ahead and make sure that, that this entire front of the plane is not contacting the workpiece during use. And I'm just going to remove a few shavings. Just keep checking your progress with a straight edge until the only two parts contacting the straight edge are these two contact points you created earlier. Before I turn this die over and install the blade and chip breaker, I want to point out that your die should have some chamfered edges along these long edges just to relieve that sharp edge there. Another characteristic of a Japanese style plane. So now I can put the chip breaker and blade in and go ahead and set the depth and see if I can make some shavings. So I'm going to set the blade in there. I'm going to set the chip breaker in nice and tight. Again, it's about a 30 second away from the cutting edge of the iron. And then you can make some test cuts. Now, what if your blade is too deep? You're making too thick of a cut. A simple solution then reseat the chip breaker and it will retract the blade just a few thousandths of an inch for a thinner shaving. So let's see what we can do with this. So I think I've got my blade set just about where I want it. We're going to take some test cuts here and see what adjustments we need to make. Now the position for a hand plane a Japanese style hand plane is using two hands. One hand is behind the blade. I like to put my index finger right behind the blade and my other fingers at the front of the plane. And then my right hand, I've got my index finger actually down in the mouth a little bit just to provide some extra leverage. And I'm just gripping the die uh, on both sides. As you're planing, you want to watch that shaving come out of the mouth. And if you see that it's only cutting on one side, you can make an adjustment by tapping the high side 
And just remember to always reseat the chip breaker before you go back to planing. You want to make sure that that blade is nice and tight in there. Then you make another test cut. You keep going until you get some nice full width shavings. You know your plane is tuned up, the blade is nice and sharp, and now you've got another tool to add to your arsenal. Hopefully you can see that setting up and using a new Japanese style hand plane isn't all that complicated. It may seem daunting at first with all the steps you have to go through, but each step is just a simple step in the process of getting optimal performance out of your hand plane. And once you do it, it's easy after that. 